Understanding a Semen Analysis in Male Fertility. Hi friends, I'm Dr. Natalie Crawford. I'm a board certified OBGYN and REI, and this channel is all about your fertility. Today I'm talking about the semen analysis. So I get asked all the time about male fertility, understanding what the semen analysis is, understanding the factors that can impact it, and today I'm going over all of that. First of all though, two things. One, if you like this channel, please subscribe. When you subscribe, it helps these videos get shared with more people and then more people can understand their bodies. Number two, I do have a course on natural fertility. You can go to nataliecrawfordmd.com to learn more about the Enhance Your Natural Fertility Program. This course is all about learning about your body and there's an entire module on male factor fertility, lifestyle factors, and what you can do and what I want you to know. So if this applies to you, it's all about how you can optimize everything and you probably wanna check it out. All right, so let's dive in first to the semen analysis. This is how we understand male fertility. This is usually the screening test because it's a functional test for how things are working. Important factors to understand. So number one, how are we preparing for a semen analysis and what is the test? Semen analysis is where we take an ejaculated sample of sperm and then we analyze it under the microscope. We're actually looking for a few different variables when we look at this. So we're looking at the volume of sperm, the pH, the concentration of the sperm, the motility, and the morphology. And that's giving us an idea into how the body is functioning. So when you're preparing for a semen analysis, you need at least two to three days of abstinence. So no intercourse, no ejaculation. We wanna make sure that we're getting a good enough sized sample to be able to evaluate the sperm. So two to three days of abstinence. Now you're gonna to wanna to understand your clinic's process. So at our clinic, you can just call and get an appointment. You don't have to have a doctor referral, but you will have to drop it off. So we don't have a collection room on site, which is pretty standard after COVID started. So are you going to go to an office and go to a collection room and collect or do you have the ability or are you required to collect at home and then bring your sample in? So if you're collecting at home and bringing it in, you don't have to keep it warm. Like that's not a thing. So, you know, room temp, ambient temperature is fine. And you usually have around an hour or two to get it there. Usually we'll say an hour. So you'll collect and then take it in. All right, be prepared that when you drop off the sample, you're gonna to have to show that's who you are, that you know we wanna make sure there's a good chain of custody between the sperm and whoever's collecting it. So be prepared to show ID, and it's not embarrassing. I mean, I know it is embarrassing, but we're a fertility clinic. We do this all the time. So you don't need to be embarrassed about bringing your sperm in. If you're bringing in your partner's sperm, you might need a copy of their ID or some identification. So just always ask if that's your game plan ahead of time because you don't wanna be frustrated not being able to leave the sample. But so you leave the sample, then what do we do? It's going to get analyzed. So we're going to do a count on the sperm. We're going to measure it and look at the pH. So let's go through the different variables and what they all mean. So the first one is volume. So if you have low volume, that's a concern that is either a collection situation, it is awkward. So sometimes there's spillage or leakage. And if you have that, I always recommend you tell whoever's receiving the sample because it's gonna put it in a different perspective for me than if I think your body just makes low volume. The volume comes from both the sperm, but also from the seminal fluid from the seminal vesicles. And that's going to help give it enough of a sample to have the right pH and to protect the sperm and the vagina. Remember that the vagina is really acidic. And so we have the sperm and the vagina, it's all gonna die, but the seminal fluid that ejaculate is actually very alkaline. So it's protective for the sperm so it can exist in the vagina and not just get killed. And then the sperm quickly swims into the female reproductive tract. So it goes through the cervix and actually makes its way to the fallopian tubes and out the ends of the tubes really rapidly. Fun fact is that the egg must be fertilized while it's in the fallopian tube. So the sperm has to go there and it has some chemoattractant properties attracting the sperm into the tube that it's actually inside. Fascinating. So the sperm quickly exits. So the size of that sample is important as is the pH. A good example of what these things can tell us when it's off is that a low volume and an acidic sample, so a low pH, can be really worrisome for cystic fibrosis. So you may not know this, cystic fibrosis is what we call an autosomal recessive disease, meaning it's a silent carrier disease. So when a person inherits two copies of the cystic fibrosis mutation, you have cystic fibrosis, which is really characterized as a bad lung disease. However, male carriers of just one cystic fibrosis gene can have something called CBAVD, congenital bilateral absence of the vas deferens. Okay, well here is a picture. So if we look at this picture, we can see sperm is made in the testes, 
and then it has to get through the ejaculatory system and it migrates into the vas deferens. If you're a cystic fibrosis carrier who has CPAVD, you're totally asymptomatic. You have no idea that you're missing your vas deferens. It's a birth defect. That's what they're congenitally absent. So you have no idea. Your ejaculate looks normal to you, but when we go and look at it, we're going to see no sperm because the sperm can't connect. We're gonna see a low pH and a low volume of fluid. And so that is a warning sign to us, hey, this person may have cystic fibrosis as a carrier and we need to screen them and screen their partner. You can still get pregnant if you have CBAVD, but you're going to need what we call a sperm extraction. And that's where we're going into the testes or the epididymis, so above the level of the vas deferens, taking out a sperm sample. And that's usually only a small enough quantity to combine that with IVF or in vitro fertilization. Very interesting. All right, so that's with volume and pH. If I get a sample that is abnormal with a really low volume, sometimes I ask for a repeat sample. So if there was spillage, I definitely will. If it's just low, but there was no spillage and the pH is normal, I'll often ask for a longer non-ejaculatory window. So I'll say, hey, can we go one week without any ejaculation? And then let's see if we have enough volume to give us normal results on the other factors. And then that may change how we counsel them when it comes to fertility treatment, but at least we can get a more accurate representation of what's in the sample. Okay, so then let's go into concentration. I find this funny and everybody always laughs at me, but you know, we think about eggs and women are born with eggs, all the eggs you're ever going to have and you run out of them over time. In the testes, it's totally different. Did you know that on average men can make 100 to 200 million sperm a day? So I always say it's like there's magic fairy cells that are just producing new sperm. They're not fairy cells, they're germ cells. But essentially they make a sperm and the lifespan of a sperm is about 90 days. It takes 72 days to develop across the course of the testes. So they actually start on one side and develop as they get to the other side. And then about 18 days to migrate through that ejaculatory system until they get into the sample. So sperm are very susceptible to whatever has happened in the past 90 days. And this is why if a man gets really ill or sick or COVID, we can see a huge drop in their sperm counts that can recover with time. But it's whatever has happened in those past 90 days is what sperm is a reflection of. It also means that just because somebody had a kid or got somebody pregnant in the past doesn't mean that their fertility is ongoing. Their sperm was good for those three months, but how is it now? So you, we're always going to want a semen analysis. And I'll often have patients say, oh, I'm the problem, it's not him, or he has kids, or he's gotten somebody pregnant. Mm -mm. We're always gonna wanna check. Maybe there's multiple problems going on and we don't know unless we look. And so you'll find most of us really require that semen analysis to be a part of the evaluation. So when we're looking at the concentration, how we define this is the number of sperm that are made per milliliter. So normal is at least 15 million per milliliter. Understanding that's the low end of normal. Average for reproduction is gonna be about 40 to 50 million per milliliter. So if you're 15, I mean, you're meeting the bare minimum, but you're going to have lower chances of fertility than somebody who's totally up at 40 to 50 million per ml. Sperm concentration is often a reflection of the signals from the brain. So your signals from the brain are helping drive sperm production. So FSH and LH from the brain are driving the production of testosterone and sperm. They develop together. A good example is if somebody is taking testosterone, which can happen because you know maybe you have fatigue or low libido and you get placed on testosterone to try to feel better, and you do. Testosterone is like male birth control. It tells the brain to stop sending out FSH and LH, and then suddenly it also halts sperm production. And that can last for months or years, depending on how long you've been on it. So a better option is if you have low testosterone and you're feeling symptomatic, make sure your physician knows you wanna get pregnant because then they're gonna put you on medications like Clomid or HCG or things that do not inhibit the body's ability to make sperm. So that's gonna be something you're gonna to wanna to ask about. And just for definition purposes, we call this oligospermia if you have low sperm counts and we call it azoospermia if you have no sperm. So azoospermia, we're always curious, is this an obstruction? Sperm is being made but can't get into the ejaculated sample or is there no sperm being made either from testicular failure or from lack of brain signals? One thing that can destroy the testes is being at too hot of an internal temperature. And one of these things can actually be from having undescended testes as a child. So if your testes were not brought down into the scrotum at an early enough age, it may have resulted in destruction of some of those germ cells or the ability of the testes to function. So that's always another big warning sign to me too, is having prior history of undescended testes or testicular surgery. Okay, next is 
fertility, and it's the number of forward moving sperm. Most semen analyses were looking for at least 40% modal, but just like concentration, that's the low end of normal. 60% or more is going to be your normal level of conceiving. So you're a little bit subfertile if you're at 40 or above, but you're not into the infertile zone. When you have abnormalities in your motility, it can be from like lifestyle or environmental factors. So this is the development of the sperm and now they can't move. What are they being exposed to? And then there's a functional value called the total modal sperm count, TMS, volume times concentration times motility. And that's really giving us an idea of the application of the functionality of the sperm. Do you have enough to get the job done? Even though everybody always says it just takes one sperm, we really want those sperm to be able to migrate towards the egg. And I think of them like an army. They have to exert enough pressure to crack open the egg and get a sperm inside. And so if you just have a very low count that are actually moving and able to get the job done, it becomes less likely that they're going to be able to fertilize that egg. A normal total modal sperm counts usually around 40 million moving sperm and suitable enough for IUI is going to be at least 20 million moving sperm. You lose about half of the sample in the wash process for IUI and we like to see at least 10 million to go into the body for IUI. And then we look at morphology. Morphology is the shape of the sperm and I find it fascinating because so many sperm are abnormally shaped and you can see that here. You can have sperm with two heads, two tails, a big head, a small tail, all these different abnormalities. Interestingly, you need to look at a semen analysis because there's two different ways that we report on morphology. The old one is called the WHO, the World Health Organization. That level you needed 15% more to be normal. In the Kruger or the strict morphology, we need 4% or more to be normal. And again, this is the low end of normal. Functionality is better the higher that it is. When you have abnormally shaped sperm, this is typically an indication for ICSI or intracytoplasmic sperm injection because it does help improve fertilization rates. We like to think in science, structure equals function. If it's abnormally shaped, can it do its job? And what is a sperm's job? To hold the DNA in the head and protect it, to swim to where it needs to be, and to fertilize an egg. And so it needs to be able to do all three of those jobs. We also think that sperm morphology is probably influenced by lifestyle, at least to some degree. And so this is why things like heat, sitting in a hot tub or a sauna, it can be really bad for the sperm. Ask can the different things you put in your body, probably sugar and some of those processed and refined foods are not excellent for production of sperm. So those antioxidants and your fruits and your vegetables and your whole grains, those are gonna be the things that are going to be the best. All right. And then your semen analysis can also report something called round cells. Now round cells cannot always be differentiated, but these can be immature sperm. They can be white blood cells or red blood cells. And so depending on what they are, you might sometimes be told to take an antibiotic or an anti-inflammatory medication and then repeat the analysis to see if there's less abnormal round cells that are present. I like to think of these as they might just clutter up the highway. If we imagine there's a lot of stalled cars on the highway, is it hard for the sperm, even if they're normal, to get to where they need to go? So the seam analysis is a really important tool because it tells us a lot, hormone production, anatomy, lifestyle. If it's normal, we're good, but if it's abnormal, we're gonna to start to talk about, are there lifestyle factors that we can change? Are there medications that can help? Are there further evaluations that may be needed? Do we need to do chromosome testing or genetic testing? Do we need a sperm extraction procedure? Is this suitable for intercourse, potentially suitable for IUI, which is intrauterine insemination, or are we in an IVF zone? And if we're in IVF, do we need ICSI or a sperm extraction or even advanced procedures? So the semen analysis is a diagnostic test that is extremely important for those of us in the fertility world. And so I'm gonna say it again. Everybody needs to get a semen analysis if you're trying to conceive and have problems. Just because you've had prior success doesn't mean the sperm is fine at this moment. All right, friends, I hope this video helped. If you want to learn more about fertility, again, you can always follow me on Instagram at Natalie Crawford MD. And if you want to learn more about natural fertility, I have the Enhance Your Natural Fertility course, which goes into how you improve some of these sperm factors as well. You can always listen to the As a Woman podcast for more in-depth fertility-related issues. Thanks, friends.